Thank you. So we are going to start um, the panel sessions. And <coughs> this year, as you uh, will see from our schedule, the theme uh, of the faculty panels is establishing your professional identity. And I'm delighted um, in particular to be able to introduce uh, the panelists uh, that we have for this morning uh, to you. They are uh, individuals who have managed to uh, figure out the system that is Harvard <laughs> and who have um, gone through the process of being promoted here at Harvard and I hope that they will be able to give you some insights about the ways in which um, these processes occur at this institution. So we have three um, associate professors in the first panel and I'd like to introduce them briefly. They will each have 10 minutes to make remarks and then we will have plenty of time at the end for um, conversation, discussion, questions and answers, etc. So our first panelist is Noni Lasso. She is the Marie and Max Kargman Associate Professor in Human Development and Urban Education Advancement at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Dr. Lasso leads a research program that focuses on the reading development and difficulties of children from linguistically diverse backgrounds. Her developmental and instructional research has implications for practitioners, researchers, and policymakers. From 2004 to 2006, Noni was senior research associate of the National Literacy Panel on Language Minority Youth and named one of five William T. Grant scholars earning a $350,000 five-year award from the W.T. Grant Foundation in support of her research on English language learners in urban public schools. Dr. Lasso is a member of the Society for the Scientific Study of Reading, International Academy for Research in Learning Disabilities, Society for Research in Child Development, and many other um, distinguished organizations. She is also a member of the Reading First Advisory Committee for the Sec Secretary of Education, the U.S. Department of Education. Dr. Lasso received her PhD at University of British Columbia, and I'm pleased to say that she recently received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers awarded by the White House in 2009. Our second panelist is Dr. Juan C. Celadon, who is Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, as well as Associate Physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Celadon's primary area of research is to identify genetic factors and environmental exposure that influence the development of obstructive airway diseases, asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases in general and among Hispanics in particular. Juan currently leads three NIH-funded studies of the genetics of obstructive airway diseases in individuals of Hispanic descent. Two of these studies employ a family-based design to examine the relation between genetic factors and asthma and COPD in an isolated Hispanic population living in the Central Valley of Costa Rica. And the third study uses a case control design to examine the relation among genes, indoor allergen exposure, and asthma phenotypes among Puerto Rican children. Dr. Celadon has been leading a study of the relation between, also between the maternal, neonatal, gut flora, and asthma and allergic diseases. He received his medical degree <coughs> from Bogota, Colombia in 1988, an MPH in quantitative methods in 1999, and a DPH in genetic epidemiology in 2001 from the Harvard School of Public Health. Our third panelist is Sarah Stewart Mukupadie, who is the John Loeb Associate Professor of the Natural Sciences. Her research focuses on collisional processes, including planet formation, catastrophic disruption, and surface modification. Laboratory measurements of the equation of state and dynamic strength of planetary materials using shockwave techniques, as well as experimental and computational studies of impact processes to interpret the resurfacing history, physical properties, and internal structure of planets, moons, asteroids, and comets. Dr. Stuart Mukupadier is the director of the Shock Compression Laboratory at Harvard. She received her PhD in planetary sciences with a minor in astrophysics um, from Caltech in Pasadena in 2002 and her AB in astronomy and astrophysics and physics here at Harvard University. Prior to coming to Harvard, she was a Carnegie postdoc fellow at the Carnegie Institution in Washington, D.C. And among her many numerous honors, Dr. Stuart Mukapadier also received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 2004. 
and uh, received most recently the Harold Urey Prize in 2009. So we will first start with Dr. Lasso and we'll um, move forward from there. Thanks. <laughs> I heard somebody say we figured out Harvard and I <laughs> felt maybe I should go back to that side of the room. Um, but thanks for the invite. Uh, I think, you know, I'll start with two kind of caveats that are, that are really inherent in this sort of exercise. And the first is, there is something extremely personal about the experience of being an academic, of being, you know, a member of an academic community. And so, you do know yourself and your circumstances best, and those are really in some ways your best guide. So that's sort of one caveat. The second is, <laughs> is that the methodologist in me says, wow, this retrospective analysis, this sort of looking back is always a, uh, a kind of dangerous venture. But um, with those caveats in mind, I really just thought about three things that I think you might consider as you go forward. And the first is really that in some ways, um, it's kind of the keep it simple factor, which is I'm sort of continually struck by the fact that the recipe for early career success is sort of remarkably simple and straightforward. And that's not that it's not difficult and that doesn't bear on level of effort, but that the actual ingredients that kind of go into early career success are the same ones that probably you heard about in grad school. They're the same ones that drove uh, your hire here, the reason that you're sitting here. Um, so my my sort of sense is that you, you just need to stay really caught up in your personal sort of personal professional plan, that you are people with strong ideas about your professional life. You had a plan by virtue of the doctorate and applying here, and that plan sells you and others around you. Um, you've thought about the way you teach. You've made a choice about the academic route. So as you kind of move forward, sort of remember that you, you do have that plan, and you, you have that in your hands still um, as you begin your career. And at the same time, what you don't want to do, so you want to get caught up in your own plan, and what you don't want to do is get totally caught up doubting or second guessing yourself by virtue of watching those around you, by hearing about what's reportedly working better for them. Uh, you know, you want to get some insights, but not to worry so much about the roads that others are taking, because in fact, there are so many roads to a successful career. Um, and and keep in mind that, you know, as President Faust said, there are so many supports here to, that, that in some ways you do have that advantage of really truly carrying out your plans because as you refine and develop your skills and ideas, you've got these tremendous supports around here to do that, both in the recent research realm and in the teaching realm. So kind of concrete things about this straightforward uh, sort of recipe for high impact solid work and good teaching. I'd say every now and again, reread the statement that you wrote when you apl applied here. Every now and again, just reread it and see how, how it's working for you, what, what's working for you. I've done that since writing my statement for uh, associate, for promotion to associate. It's a very clarifying experience, right, when one sets out their plans and their philosophy about their teaching and their, and their goals. And so reread that every now and again. Um, the second thing is, and this sort of feeds into this slight tension between collaboration and, and trying to carve out what's yours. But I personally, looking back, and again, this is sort of the two cents, um, I think try to get something that's truly yours in the first several years that you're here. And I don't say that like it can't be part of collaborative work, but I do think that early on it makes sense to have a project or some kind of initiative that feels like yours. And I'm not you know, that might be a grant to carry out a study, it might be a book contract, it might be launching some kind of initiative. And here I'm really not talking about the politics or sort of playing your cards, but I am, I am sort of thinking that there are things that you need to do to establish yourself, but also to give yourself that added confidence to really say, this is kind of what I'm working on, even if it's a piece of an overall collaborative endeavor. It can kind of, it can kind of keep you um, pushing forward. And so even in a collaborative sort of interdisciplinary approach, there are still ways to kind of carve out pieces that are yours. And, and so in my case, for example, I got a small grant from the NICHD from the National Institutes of Health in my second year, late in my second year. And it just kind of practically speaking gave me a boost. I hired some students 
who were here on campus. The money was here at Harvard. Um, it was my account, but it was also just a boost for my career. It was kind of a push in the right direction. And so it doesn't have to be all that you're doing. It doesn't have to be monumental, but it's something that you feel like is yours early on. And finally, uh, on the sort of straightforward piece, I'd say, you know, I think stay as close as you can to your research and teaching. Presumably, you didn't do a PhD to kind of think a lot about the administration of the organization. And so um, I would say if you can keep the politics at an arm's length, and I actually, again, don't say this so much with politics per se in mind, but I do say it with your own time in mind, which is that, you know, in part, I can almost guarantee that in the next several years, somebody, a dean or a department chair or a member of senior faculty, will tap you on the shoulder to do something in particular, some additional service, your participation in a new initiative that they're launching, the development of some kind of new course, kind of getting a course off out of the brackets and back onto the books. Um, and it is additional, it is, it can, those kinds of endeavors can be intensive you will say yes when that happens because you just will. And so what you want to do is feel like that's actually time well spent and feel like that's sort of your, your chance to be, to shape something new, to contribute to the organization, to be seen. It ends up being constructive and productive. And so keep that in mind as you go forward is that probably there'll be a time when you really are going to have to channel some energy into the, into the administration of the organization. So that's sort of a little about the recipe. The second thing that I really want to kind of push a little bit on is that this really is a marathon. It's really not a sprint. And so don't come out of the gates and empty the tank in a really short time because you are really going to need to pace yourselves over the next several years. And so I think that can be really tricky, particularly when, you know, by year two you're preparing a package that you know, is, is for review, but ultimately this is kind of a long-range enterprise. Whether you're here or at any other institution, the academic enterprise is one that sort of takes time, and to really develop good ideas and do really solid work, you do need the time, but you also need to pace yourself. And so I sort of think of it two ways, both practically, this isn't a marathon, um, or sorry, this is not a sprint, but also intellectually it's not a sprint, which is that you don't want to spread your, you don't want to get so involved. It's very easy to kind of have this, your hand in this and this and this and not to be going sort of deep uh, in, in sort of one particular area that, or, pr or tackling one particular problem. So um, think not just about the next one or two years, but try to think even five, seven, ten years out. Probably five or seven is really where you're going to be most comfortable. And you want to think about different priorities at, at different stages so that, you know, some semesters become much more about your teaching than they do about your research and other semesters become much more about the pro pro funding for proposals and that kind of thing. And you just want to be sort of pacing yourself so that you're not trying to work on everything all at once. And, um, you know, it really does work for me to liken my, my junior years. I'm now in year seven to the marathon, which is that, you know, the two big mistakes one makes when they run a race poorly. One is you start out too fast. The second is you start to lose focus about half, two-thirds of the way through. Kind of have to dig deep, stay really focused um, mentally and, and, uh, and keep pushing. Um, and, and ultimately you need something left in the tank. So if we take the five or seven year plan, I would say what happens is over time, in some ways, in some ways, this, the years right now can feel the most stressful at some level because the place is new, because you're adjusting, because it's you're sort of you haven't figured it all out. You're kind of getting getting a sense of the institution, but also the job of an academic. So there is that stress associated with the newness. But by virtue of your advancing career over time, what happens is your load kind of very gradually but very steadily increases and becomes heavier and heavier. Right. And so in my case, for example, right over there across the street, there's two postdocs, three full-time research associates, several uh, doc students, you know, two large federal grants, uh, big projects, and research assistants across the country that we're working with. And that's just a part of my picture, right? That's the research side, which is fine because, you know, as most people advance their careers, you know, that's going to happen. The key is that in academia, you've got these mechanisms where actually you can, 
find time. And so my concrete suggestion is to be thinking ahead about the grants and fellowships that really do buy out your time and let you focus. Because as part of establishing your reputation is, is being able to carve out the time to do the good work and be part of intellectual communities here and elsewhere, um, then, then the trick is to find the time to do that. So I'm not really the person to tell you all about the different fellowships and grants in your particular fields, but I will say to really think through and, and do your research on those tailored to early career scholars. So uh, it doesn't mean that it has to be practical money to do research. It can, it's often just money to buy out your time. And so what comes to mind for me are uh, awards like the NSF Early Career Award, the Robert Johnson Scholars, which is not for early careers, but it can be really well used in the early career the W.T. Grant Foundation Scholars Award, which is one I have, five, that's a five-year award that is sort of 50% of my time every year, which is significant. Um, Foundation for Child Development, the Radcliffe Fellowships that uh, President Faust uh, in part initiated. There are a number of initiatives like that and folks around who know that. Some of them come with mentoring, some of them come with networking opportunities, and, and that's good visibility, but mostly you really want to stay focused on finding the time. And as you develop those applications, think a little bit about your timing, which is that it's not, it, it, it is often the case that fellowships and grants that kick in and give you more time kind of midpoint, three, year three, four, five, can be really, really um, valuable. It's also the case that, you know, what happens is, is sometimes the time later actually is directly related to really high impact work that's going to affect sort of your career going forward. If you're people with a um, one year, one semester junior leave, think too about the timing for that because it can be tempting to use it early on, but it's also the case that I've talked with several folks and myself included who are really happy to have held on to that until a little later when it, when it really does serve the value of protecting your time. So it's not to say the next couple years aren't important ones because they are and you do need to protect your time and get, get your things done. But think through not exhausting all your sort of buyout and fellowship opportunities early on. Think about sort of pacing yourselves in that sense. And finally, I, I'll just say one, one last thick thing, which is you know the topic for today is really uh, this professional identity piece. And I think I'll, I'll really say two things here. One is that you're always constructing your professional identity. You're always sort of casting yourself in some kind of light here at Harvard, but also equally as importantly, and I think sometimes that's uh, easy to forget, that you're casting, you, you are cr creating a professional identity outside of the institution regularly in print and uh, informally and formally uh, in, in conversation. And so you want to be seen as somebody who's uh, collegial, who's doing not just high quality work, but is of high integrity, and who's a good peer across different settings um, and, and in and outside the institution. The concrete suggestions, I mean, to be, to establish a positive personal, you know, kind of professional identity, there are, there are a few things. One is you need the supports to do that. You need supports professionally and personally need supports inside of the institution, but you also need supports outside of the institution. So that in fact, one of the things I'd really recommend is talking with others at other institutions about, about professional life and, and kinds of issues because it can really bring a lot more perspective to the way that you interpret things that are happening here. It can also give you some really good ideas about managing your professional life. So other juniors here on campus, but also folks outside and on the, at, at other institutions. And finally, on mentoring, because this came up sort of as one possible topic for today, I think mentoring is a tricky thing, and I'll, I'll say that right flat out. I think it's it's a human enterprise. It's one of relationships. I think you can't you can't always force relationships, as we know in our professional and personal lives. Um, so mostly, I think of it this way: um, you have to be comfortable. It has to be natural. It has to be something that evolves over time. Both the mentoring that you get and your own mentoring of others, right? Because already you're gonna start to mentor folks here. Um, so I would say, you know, stay with your plan, let it happen naturally. As things progress, there's gonna be people that you gravitate towards, there's gonna be people that you realize where 
you know, it's, it's really quality, not quantity. So you don't need a lot of contact with good mentors. Some of the best mentorship I've had is actually from someone outside of the institution who's a member of the senior faculty elsewhere, who I see very sporadically, but you know, 20, 30 minutes, a drink at a conference, a beer, can be, can be really clarifying and really helpful. That's sort of no, nothing formal about that relationship, nothing particularly ongoing or frequent. But when it happens, it, those conversations are really helpful. So I, I would really suggest, you know, um, thinking about quality and not quantity and sort of seeing what emerges. And, and you'll have a better sense as time goes on of the kind of feedback that you really need and how to get that. Um, but it takes time. I think good, good mentoring relationships do take time to develop. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to start with a very wise statement, a statement from the mother of Forrest Gump, in that Oscar will be moved to two slides and box of chocolates. Uh, you never know what you're going to get. That summarizes my life today. So uh, I'm going, to, I believe that each faculty member, every one of you, has a unique set of life experiences that ultimately will, if it hasn't already, profoundly influence your academic career. So I have to tell you a little bit about my life then some more. I was born in 1964 in Barranquilla, Colombia. That's a town on the Caribbean coast uh, of Colombia. It's in northwest most part of South America. People born in the Caribbean, this is the general region uh, on the sea, constitute one third of the population of Colombia. It's about 40 million. The last president to be born in the Caribbean to be elected was in 1886. You're going 122 years without having a Caribbean president. We are quite different. Our culture, our accent is different. The media uh, often reminds us of that. We're stereotyped on a daily basis. I was going to come to the US uh, for college. Those were my plans. And uh, when I was 15, my sister, who was an economist at Ann Arbor, uh, died in a car accident. That was the first profound event that uh, influenced my life. I had to change my plans. I was the youngest of five siblings. And instead of coming here to the US, I had to go to the heart of the Andes in Bogota, Colombia. This is the second oldest university in the Americas. Yes, it is older, older than Harvard University. <laughs> uh, it's a Jesuit school. My class had 84 people. There were only four people from the Caribbean. There were times when you know, a professor would make a joke which wasn't at all funny to us, and my friends and I had to bite our tongue and walk away. We use that as motivation. You always have to channel your anger for positive things. Of the four, three, they're already the top of the class. Two of us are in the States. One of them is a world authority in a stroke. So I decided that I wanted to come to this country to do research. And I sent 400 letters of application. I applied to every program in the United States and territory, including one in Puerto Rico. <laughs> After sending 400 letters, I got seven interviews. One of these interviews was at Lincoln Hospital, which is in the South Bronx. That's the poorest congressional district in this nation. I took a taxi from Manhattan there. And there was this Dominican man who was a philosopher. He looked at me, you know, had a tie, had an overcoat. He said, you look like a nice boy. Why are you going to the Bronx? And I said, you know, I'm a foreigner. This is one of very few places who would give me an interview. He paused, looked at me again, and said, the whites are sending you there to die. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did survive, you know, I saw firsthand uh, the effects of segregation, uh, profound segregation. Americans often act horrified about violence elsewhere, but they don't look at places like the Bronx harshly. 
the inner city. Look in your own town. I served an internship there, and then uh, I uh, went on to do residence at Beth Israel in New York. And then I always tell my mentees that you cannot control who your parents are. That's a random event. Why is either blessed or not? But you can control who you spend the rest of your life with. So the best decision in my life is not in my life. <laughs> I say that without hesitation. Then, in 1995, <laughs> I wanted to stay, and I had a visa called a J-1, which is the worst visa you can have. You better have been a legal alien than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mail again form of the letters of application. I looked into every government agency, and I got one interview, which was at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Erie, Pennsylvania, that's close to Toronto, Canada. Uh, in the lakes, and I served two years for the government there as an internist, a pulmonologist, and then they granted me permanent residence in this country, which is when I applied to come to Harvard. A day came here, uh, and as a research fellow, I took a pay cut of 67% before adjusting for cost of living. My conservative estimation was the pay cut was 80% after you adjust for that. My first child had to be born, I moonlighted 16 weekends in a row to have the down payment for my home, which is still in framing it, quite a little connected as well. In 1999, I was submitting uh, an application, was about to submit an application for an entry level grant to the NIH. That was August. I was taking a plane to go to Costa Rica, where two of my research projects are, when my wife called. And I said to my mentor, one of my mentors who was by my side, because somebody died. My wife would never call me about somebody dying. I thought of my second child, who had been born two weeks earlier than that. But in fact, my only brother had been murdered by a psychopath in a mass murder suicide. Uh, copycat and some of the events in Atlanta and Seattle. Uh, he killed three or four people and then he got to his head. And suddenly I had to deviate, uh, go to Columbia, and have two nephews, 11 and 8, come and embrace me and realize that I was the last male survivor of my family because I had lost my father seven years earlier. I did submit my grant to the NUM. And the grant did not get funded, but I resubmitted the grant. And it was funded in 2001 when I also got my doctorate from the School of Public Health. Subsequent to that, I became an assistant professor I got two uh, large grants funded from NIH. I was blessed, you know, getting a mentoring award and teaching award from medical school. And I uh, became an associate professor in April of 2007. So I'll give you my few pieces of advice. Uh, Santiago and Monica Howe, who's a Spaniard, he won the Nobel Prize, who's a neuroscientist. He summarized this and modified this slide. The first one is you have to have the capacity to criticize the work of others, but particularly your own. The best advice I ever got was never believe any data, particularly your own. Desire for originality, you have to find novel things as a function of academia. Focus, that's safety. You have very limited time. You have to attend to many different things. You have to focus. Honesty about all things, even when temptations abound, you have to love the truth. Outstanding work has passion. You have to love what you do. There's no doubt of that. Spirit of service above all things. And the son of a physician, above all, we serve others. And perseverance, the most important. There are some of the things that I see for uh, new faculty. There are great opportunities. There uh, are outstanding educational and training opportunities. I took advantage of several of those. And that allows you to develop a unique set of skills. You have to set yourself apart. At my uh, place, most people go for a master's degree. Nobody had done a doctorate. But at the time I was doing that, with two children and doing all this moonlighting, I realized that genetics was the wave of the future. 
And the only way I could get additional training was by doing a doctorate. Many people thought I was crazy, and I am crazy, but I did it. Then you also have outstanding trainees. Many people take uh, these people sort of as disposable, or, you know, people who can be recycled. I view them very differently. They are the lifeblood of my program. If you treat your people well, many of these people are extraordinarily bright, word of mouth will bring more people to you. And they come to you and they want to work with you because you provide a, a good environment for them. Never take them lightly. You can also establish unbelievable collaborations you know, across uh, campus. There are also huge challenges. When somebody is recruited here, particularly at junior level, I'm talking about <coughs> medical school, the high cost of living in this city cannot be forgotten. I told you how much more lighting I had to do. That's a daily reality. When you have had somebody work for 30 hours, you know, and then ask them to do something, this is quite difficult for them. It's remarkable that they get to do something. The quality of mentorship varies enormously. Uh, in, I'm talking about the medical school again. Uh, varies across institutions, varies across departments. It's highly variable across divisions. There are some people who are outstanding mentors, almost saints in their own way, but there are also tormentors and dementors. <laughs> As a minority, uh, I have to say this, I've said this openly, there is a profound dearth of underrepresented minorities in senior leadership positions. It's appalling, it's depressing. There are no division chiefs or department chiefs in my own institution. <clears throat> that has several negative effects. It affects morale. The number of Hispanic colleagues that I've seen leaving in the last 10 years is extraordinary. They leave because they see no, no clear path you know, to a leadership position. It affects advocacy and fundraising. It's very hard for me, you know, the people that I do research on are disproportionately represented among the poor. I don't have a constituency that is rich. If I don't have people at the top advocating for that who are truly and genuinely and passionately interested in it, and it's not lip service, that is a problem. Finally, when there is conflict, unfortunately at the current time, most of the panels that, that resolve this conflict do not include minorities. And I can tell you that I, am, I can attest to this, that there are instances where I really had a wish that there was somebody from minority group involved. The ultimate goal of all these things, and this was fairly well articulated by the previous speaker, is to establish you know, your identity as an independent investigator, who you are, what you do. Finally, this is a highly competitive environment. Um, to say that any of you can do this alone is delusional. We're all grains of sand. You have to find sources of inspiration and support. To me, that's been my parents who gave me two precious gifts. One was my faith. Faith takes you over everything. And the second one is the spirit of service, a genuine <coughs> desire to serve. The second is my wife. In Latin America, people are taught to pray to the guardian angel, and I did better on that, I married mine. <laughs> Third is you need mentors. You need mentors within your institution, but mentors outside your, the, the institution, <coughs> as previously mentioned, are unbelievably helpful. And I had three people, senior people, who took an interest in my career early on and whose advice I treasure. Finally, you know, in my own circumstances, thousands of people have died in my country as a byproduct of violence. There were many times when I was in the Bronx, in New York, here, where my will faltered and my spirit weakened. Somehow, I could see their angels urging me to go on. I'm very fortunate to lead a program, you know, trying to uh, help elucidate causes of respiratory systems in planet. I think it's a privilege. The final thing is, you know, when I have a mentee, and this is very important in an environment like this, many people thirst for power and glory, and they get lost. That's all they care about. I've seen this many times. What for? In Roman times, when a general came from a victorious campaign, there were two slaves in Iscariot. 
one to hold his laurels, and the other one to whisper that all God is for me. Never forget that. So, my own belief, everybody has to define what success is. People are at their best when they are able to think beyond themselves. Jackie Robinson, who's the first African American to play in the major league, said once that life has no meaning except for the impact that it has on the lives of others. I believe in that. So every one of you will have you know, his own definition of success. To me, you have to advance. You have to be promoted. You have to aspire to leadership. But that is to help others and to serve. That is not you know, for some sake or other reason. So to me, success is honoring the memory of those peoples who, whom I lost by serving those who remain. Motivating others, the young people who will be here long after we all live, to serve others. Try to be a positive influence, and most of all, supporting a lot of my family. I said, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak briefly about some thoughts that uh, reinforce some of the things that have been said already and, and focus on some other issues. Just how many of you know what your job is? Do you feel like you know? And, that's, and it's, it's, it's not really a rhetorical question. What ran through your mind? Because when I arrived, I said, where's the faculty handbook? And there wasn't one at the time. <laughs> and I think there is one now. Um, and there was one little workshop um, which focused on teaching mostly and tried to explain what Harvard undergrads were like. And I was one, so it really was <laughs> not uh, a, a very good job orientation. And so the practical matter is that you're a researcher, a teacher, a manager of money, of people, a psychologist of those people. Um, you have this service component which contributes to the governance of this incredibly complex organization and you've got one little cog that you're helping turn in your department at the beginning. And it's an impossible job description and you've been trained in maybe the one researcher aspect of it. And so you've quickly got to figure out how to handle all these different hats. And you're not going to get any formal education on it. You can ask for advice uh, from people around you. You can try and model the ones that you think are most successful. But you yourself are going to have to figure out how to divide your own abilities and what you're going to put some effort into training yourself on. And I'm going to phrase it that way because the faster you train yourself to wear these different hats easily, the more effective you're going to be in that you will spend less time wasting time mismanaging things or putting effort into places where there's very little payoff. And this question of how you manage your time is, is huge. It's your most valuable resource and you're going to have to be extremely defensive of the time that you spend on scholarship. And everyone handles that in a different way. They do all their work in writing at home in the evening, which worked great for me until I had kids and that became impossible. Some people have on their calendars, you know, certain blocks that are, that are sacred. The door is closed, the phone is off, your email program is closed, and you're working. And you, you don't let the world distract you because all of your other aspects of your job, especially teaching, have shorter term deadlines that are going to try and fill all available time. And the most common mistake that I see junior faculty making, and I was guilty, is that you spend every day in between lectures preparing for lectures for your first course. And you prepare about five times as much material as you can possibly deliver in an hour, and you had wasted a day where you could have spent two hours preparing the right amount of material for a one hour lecture, and then the rest of your day actually doing scholarship. And so I say this, and some people say you can't spend only two hours preparing an hour lecture, but there was actually a study done at Princeton, which I ran into in about my second or third year, where they had polled all of the 
successful mid-career faculty, you know, a, extremely detailed survey of how they spent their time. And there was a very strong correlation between people who limited um, time spent away from research and then their eventual success, which makes sense. It's just very easy to get caught up in short-term deadlines. On navigating Harvard, <laughs> Harvard is a maze. It's impossible. I mean, now at least there are things like a handbook that can help point you in directions to find things, but resources are available for almost everything, and the hard part is trying to find them. And so you'll ask your senior colleagues and department chairs, but things change, and they won't know what's available to you now, today. And so then you start finding administration people who are you should get to know who you should ask what things are out there. And I'll just list a few. Um, there's a lot available for childcare, for travel, parents in a pinch I use today with my sick baby. Um, there's mortgage help. There's a publication fund for junior faculty, $5,000 to use towards publication, um, which I learned about this year and none of the other people in the department knew about. <laughs> so, that's an FAS, yes, so that is true. There, there are differences between schools. And there's faculty aid. So um, try and find out because these things will make your life easier. What you have at your advantage by being here are the people. And you have an incredible quality of colleagues, quality of students, quality of administrative staff support that I know from talking to my colleagues at other schools that they just simply don't have and it will save you time if you learn how to use them. Learn how to use your assistance effectively in management of your program and in preparation for lectures and the more you can do that the more you will save time for your scholarship. In terms of there's this question about mentorships, and I agree, I go back and forth. You're going to get assigned a mentor by someone at some time, <laughs> or offered a mentor, or offered to be a mentor. And you have to think about what you want to get out of that relationship. And you can get very good things, and at times it's so artificial that it's not useful. So what you want to do is keep your eye out for the accidental mentor. And then once you've found that person, nurture that relationship. But it, it won't come through one of these arbitrarily assigned things. And ideally it would be someone who's not in your, I go back and forth on in your department. It would be great to also have someone outside of your department that you can talk to because at some point you will need help and you will want to admit to somebody that you need help and you're going to need that other person out there to help you refocus. And if you don't have that person, you'll spend a lot of time being lost before you can get back on track. And I say that there's an accidental mentor out there because in your research, in addition to staying straight arrow in what you're doing so that you will actually accomplish something, you want to keep yourself open through accidental conversations in the department, at conferences, for those seeds of new projects that you could only do because you're here. And you do that by talking to people. You ask people what they're doing, you have something that's on your mind now that you tell them about, and every once in a while it leads to a click and you've got a whole new project in a new direction that you wouldn't have gotten if you weren't at Harvard. And so keep yourself receptive to that in addition to having your focused program, but you're going to have to make a decision and it needs to be a conscious decision. Are you changing your research program to take advantage of it? Or are you staying on track and saving it for later or keeping it limited? But those kinds of decisions that you make in these first few years need to be conscious and not, and, and what I'm trying to say is that you don't let your career be a little bit of a random walk <laughs> um, in, in these early stages. My advice on um, this getting to your associate promotion is generally not to think about it and that Thinking about tenure, thinking about promotions is not itself uh, a good use of your energy <laughs> unless you're reviewing your focus, which is, which is going to help the promotion process, but not, don't do it because of, from, because of a review. You're doing it because you're keeping yourself focused. And, this nev and the main reason why you don't want to think about it is because the criteria is something ridiculous. You need to be great. 
you know, I, my parents ask me, you know, what, 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 what's involved in being prom promoted? I have to be great in something. <laughs> and that's an impossible definition to work toward, and it goes to one very good point on why are you here, and it's not because you want to get promoted, because that's just, you know, it's an impossible standard. There's, there's no concrete definition to measure yourself against. And so you're doing something because of your passion for your research and your other personal reasons. And so on being great means knowing uh, really what your contribution is, what your main questions are, and you're trying to develop relationships internally so that people in the department know why you're great because everyone's in a different field they're not necessarily going to appreciate what's so great about what you're doing, and it's okay to tell them. And then nurturing your relationships outside of Harvard, which will be the most important when you come up for review, so that they know why you're great, and that you have a good established presence outside of Harvard, which means you have to balance your time away from here at meetings as well as here. And in regards to thinking about money, raising money, recognition, trying to get appointments on important panels, committees, those things follow good research and having good relationships. And you don't seek them out directly. You focus on your program and being known for something, you focus on having good, strong professional relationships, and then things will follow directly from that. The money follows the good work. And I'll say I had two kids on tenure track three and a half years old and a half year old. <laughs> it's possible. My time management skills, you know, went through the roof once I had kids. Before that, it was a waste of time everywhere. And after that, I really got <laughs> focused. <laughs> so that's one strategy, but maybe not the best strategy for learning how to manage your time. And I'll end there, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay.